Our last guest of the day is one of the world's best skaters. He won the bronze medal at the 2018 Winter Olympics, and he happens to be gay, the first openly gay athlete from the United States to win a medal at the Winter Olympics. He's, he's also a fascinating person to listen to on lots of other issues. He's an outsized presence in sports, but when he is not on the ice, he commands attention as an LGBTQ plus advocate. Welcome, Adam Rippon. Hey, Adam, how, hey, how are you? Good to see you. I'm so pleased to see you. So let me just start out. You have a book out, and I have to admit that I haven't read it yet, but it just sounds, uh, it sounds perfect for me. Beautiful on the outside, and, and I know uh, that what you share is a bit of your own journey uh, in being one of the uh, uh, most famous athletes, most uh, considered most beautiful, <laughs> uh, you know, snarkiest and snazziest. But, but tell us about your journey um, a, a, as now a, a gay leader. Um, so the title Beautiful on the Outside is sort of tongue in cheek. Um, I think in, in no matter who you are, you've always had these moments in your life where you've pretended like everything is absolutely fine. Um, but on the inside, you are dealing with so many different demons or different issues that, that, that are holding you back. And um, I really, in the book, wanted to kind of explore those situations. And instead of being embarrassed by the setbacks that I had, um, to kind of wear them as um, like a badge of honor. And um, I, when I wrote this book, I really wanted people to see those experiences and to know that, like, you know, yes, I had setbacks, but they were never failures. Um, they were only failures if I didn't learn from them, which, it, you know, hey, it took me a minute to learn from all of them. Um, and I'm still learning, but it's there are always uh, opportunities to kind of learn and grow from them. Is it, you know, I have so many friends that are fans of yours and watched you perform and all of this. It sounds like you have great friends. Yeah, yeah. Um, but, but is your sport one where uh, there's discrimination? You know, I think this is something that's come up a lot, that sometimes we have to be careful with our assumptions, that it is actually harder out there than people understand. Is it harder to be gay in figure skating than, than we may understand or know, or in sports in general? I think in figure skating specifically, it's different than you mm -hmm. would think. Um, the, a lot of the hesitation, I would say the culture has changed dramatically since my uh, appearance at the Winter Games. Um, I think that like the culture within the U.S. figure skating body is so much different towards their with their attitude towards LGBTQ plus athletes. And I think it's for the better. I think it's great. Um, but I will say that in my experience and in my journey of coming out as an athlete, um, truly the, the most pushback I had was the fear that other people were experiencing or because they thought I was going to receive backlash. And um, I think in people trying to help me, it created more... Um, it created more fear for me to come out. Uh, basically, you know, in a sport where um, you are judged by other people for, you know, presentation, it's half of your score. Um, and if someone doesn't like you, they can really, mm. you know, completely change that around. Um, and there was always this fear that, like, if somebody just didn't like me or felt like maybe my style was too gay or, you know, that's such a blase term that you know what what does that even mean but if it was just somebody's not cup of not someone's cup of tea it was it would be very easy to just kind of lower the marks um but it, it for me being out just felt like something that i really needed to do and i have I, I became such a better athlete because of it let me take everybody back to south korea with you for a minute and uh uh, I think it was South Korea, and you decided to have a bit of a Twitter dance with Vice President Mike Pence and his I team. I didn't. He did. So tell us about that, because it's a fascinating moment where you did not, you didn't give an inch, and uh, you were you taken on by any number of the people around us. But but tell, please uh, tell our audience about that moment, because in a way, that became a defining moment for you and for many people who said. Do you know, we don't have to, to um, walk back. We, don't, we, we can be, you know, this is still Pride Month. And so that was a proud moment for a lot of people. So tell them. Well, in 
Um, the weeks leading into the Olympic Games, I was doing a bunch of interviews. And um, I did this one interview with Christine Brennan for USA Today, and she asked me what I thought of Mike Pence um, being head of the athlete delegation. And, you know, when you're an athlete, you're so ready to give these kind of cookie cutter answers. And at that point, I knew the Olympics was either going to be one of my last or my final competition. And I thought, you know what, I want to have the best Olympic experience I absolutely can. And what that meant for me was to go into every event as the most prepared athlete I could and to go into inter every interview and just be honest and have, you know, honest conversations, whether they were funny or serious, but <laughs> to be honest. Um, and she asked me this question and I was sitting in the parking lot of my, of the rink that I was training at. And it's like next to a Taco Bell. So I'm like looking at the Taco Bell and I'm like, am I really going to talk, you know, smack about Mike Pence? And I was like, I am, because I don't <laughs> think that he's a good representation of, of all of the athletes. Um, and, um, especially he doesn't represent me, um, and I think his values are completely askew if, you know, you're a, a good Catholic man, but you stand behind, you know, Donald Trump. Um, I, you know, I don't think that your priorities are straight. And I said the abridged version. I, you know, gave her the Cliff Notes version of what I'm telling you now. Um, and then the next day I was getting a ton of phone calls from uh, U.S. Uh, from the Olympic Committee, from U.S. figure skating, from the agent that I had. And I was like, oh, no, I'm in trouble. And I thought it was because I made a joke on some other interview or something or whatever. And uh, what they said was that the office of the vice president had um, reached out and they wanted to set up uh, a conversation that I could have with um, with Mike Pence. And, um, you know, I'll tell you, Olympics sometimes throws you right into the fire and um you know, when you hear that the vice president wants to talk to you, it sounds like an honor. Um, <laughs> you, know, you know, that's how you're brought up. You know, it's an honor to speak to the president, to the vice president. And I, I took a moment and I thought about it. And um, I called the, the media relations woman who's a good friend of mine. Her name is Barb. I called Barb back and I said, Barb, you know, I thought about what I wanted to say to the vice president. She's like, oh, okay, well, how do you want us to move forward? I said, call them back and tell them to like shove it. I'm not talking to them. <laughs> and um, she said, okay, uh, maybe I'll word it differently. I was like, word it however you want. I do not care. I do not need to speak to Mike Pence eh, three weeks before I'm going to the Olympics. So the story doesn't go any further. And then once I get there, it gets leaked that they reached out and I said no. And then, you know, in very Trump administration fashion, they lie and said that they didn't reach out. Then it, they admitted that they did reach out. Then Mike Pence started uh, tweeted at me and it became this whole snowball with I didn't say anything. Very in the vein of everything going on that they always have going on. I, I would just Listen, say that I thought I was a mess. They are a disaster. <laughs> well, thank you. I mean, I think these moments are important because you showed resolve. You you did this. And I think one of the things we've been talking to today, in fact, I wanted to ask you about the Okra Project. We just had Eon Field Stewart on and we're just talking about examples. People are inspiring. You know, whatever political stripe you're at, you know, ch talk to Chastin Buttigieg a little bit, who's trying to reach people, you know, who are feeling anguish or in the closet or out there. And so those moments that you may have accidentally stumbled into but performed well, maybe that's part of your, your shtick uh, in this, uh, nonetheless caught a lot of attention. You are supportive of the Okra Project and mm -hmm. trans black women, and uh, it, it's something I recently came to know about Okra Project and Eon's work. Why is this an important cause for you? Well, I also recently um, discovered what the Okra Project was and what they do. Um, and um, it was sort of in light of uh, the tweets that J.K. Rowling was putting out and oh. basically questioning the existence of black or, or well, of trans people in, in general. 
Um, and in this like in, in this like historical moment we're having for like racial equality, um, I've really wanted to learn more about like black history because I want to educate myself. I, I even think of like LGBTQ plus history that, you know, I didn't even know what Stonewall was or what happened at Stonewall um, 51 years ago until maybe two or three years ago. So I didn't even know what that was. I just wasn't taught about it in school. I, I didn't know about Black Wall Street. I didn't know so much Black history that we don't know. We don't learn LGBTQ plus history. We have to learn this stuff in school. It's so, it's so important. And um, I think right now is a moment that we all should be educating ourselves. And when it came to the Okra Project, I really was looking for something that I, I, I could donate to. And um, I've been trying to be vocal in things that I am supporting so that I, I, other people can be inspired to do the same. And um, I, I found the Okra Project and I just think that the work they do is really, really cool. And um, I, I, I'm such a huge supporter. And what an honor for me to be talking to you on the same day that you've talked to the Okra Project. Well, I, I, you know, I appreciate that, and, and thank you. It's an honor to talk to you. But I mean, you have a perspective, and you have, you know, this. You've decided to make these issues a cause for yourself right now. You've written about, about, about this. And I guess I want to ask you an unfair question, which is, as you look at groups like Okra, or maybe the Human Rights Campaign, or you know, Glad. I know you've been working with Glad, and we had the CEO of Glad on earlier. It was very, very powerful. But I just sometimes wonder if we're missing part of the question. I didn't know about. Uh, the Tulsa massacre in 1921. I did not know uh, about the the um, killings of, of of black trans women at the level. I knew there was violence, but not to the level that we were. So I feel I'm I'm older than you, but I feel like I have the same thing. And I just wonder, do we have blind spots? Are we somehow not as inclusive as we pretend to be, even in the LGBTQ equation? And I'd just love to get your insights as a young person in this about what you'd like to see more from inside our own community that we don't have today? Well, I think um, we just aren't given the correct information. Like if we think about right now, um, marriage, the Marriage Equality Act has been around longer than the Confederacy was around. But we act like these Confederate soldiers and these monuments are so important and we're, that you know, people are freaking out because they feel like we're erasing history. We're not erasing history. We were never taught history. You know, you just named so many different things that we weren't taught in school. I was not taught those things in school. So how can people say that we are erasing history when they don't even know it in the first place? And I think that's a huge blind spot is that we, we can't learn from the past because so many of us haven't been taught what happened in the past. And I think that's something that's so important. Education. We need to know where we've come from. That's how we learn from these things. And I think that's the biggest thing right now is that so many of us aren't educated. It's so hard for so many people to see that um, even if they feel like they've had to work so hard to get just a little bit further, that their journey was a little bit easier and came with a point came from a point of privilege of just being white. And I think you truly don't understand or even begin to understand what your privilege entails until you start to really educate yourself. And um, I've been trying to do that and I've mm. been trying to um, learn as much as I can, especially in these moments right now. And I think truly that's the biggest blind spot that we have. And I think within mm. our community, the, the biggest thing that we can do is listen. Um, and, uh, you know, you think of the, all of the people in our community who have made such a big difference, you know, they, they also had kind of nothing to lose at, at those moments in their right. life. You think of like Marsha P. Johnson, um, you know, she had nothing to lose. So of course she, she was sort of like this pioneer. She had only things to gain and she had, didn't want people to go through the same experiences that, that she went through. And, um, I think that if you are, you feel like you have um, a voice within your community, use it to amplify people who feel like they aren't being heard. Adam, I have a question for you, but before we go to that, I wanted to just ask you, because it's something that hasn't come up a lot today, on whether you have any mentors that are LGBTQ plus who've helped 
be good guides or advisors? Uh, or if not, do you have heroes that you look up to um, as you've evolved in this space? Um, I think, so truly, I was like not involved or I, I don't consider myself like an activist or anything, but I consider really? myself to have a, <laughs> no, I just have a big mouth. And so <laughs> um, I, I think since, especially since after the Olympics, like, you know, I didn't even know what Stonewall, what do you think I was going to do? It's like Stonewall. I'm like, it's the, like bricks. Is that mortar? Like, I didn't know what it was. Um, I'm going to send you a video it, clip that I watched this morning of the original of, of Stonewall rights and the first gay pride um, uh, march. Oh. I'm going to send these to you because you got to watch them. Yeah, please. So you okay, know, so you're I, not you know, an activist, so called, but yeah, go ahead. Well, yeah, and and so I'm just running my mouth over town. Um, and so basically, after Olympics, I kind of got thrown into this stuff because yeah, I want to I want to help. I want to use. I want to do everything I can to be helpful. Um, I don't. I'm so sorry. I did both of my hands in the frame like that. Was so sad. Um, <laughs> But uh, I felt necessary. So, so can I, I frame I, it? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. So I, I wanted to use my voice. And so I became more involved in different organizations. And then I got to meet so many people who did educate me. I became friends with black trans women. I became friends with so many different kinds of LGBTQ plus people. And when I became friends with them, you know, I started following them like on Instagram and Twitter and keeping in touch with them. And I think I got to see a little bit into their world. And I think the people in my life who I consider my friends have become mentors of mine. Hmm. We have got a question for you from Mo. I love your hands here. Oh, I guess That's, this way. Yeah, yeah, there we go. We can get it up together. Um, Mo. Hi, everyone. Thank you for being here. My name is Mohammed Abdul Rahim, or Mo for short, and I'm a senior consulting associate at Mercer, where I work in diversity and inclusion and HR transformation. I'd like to hear from some of the panelists about the role that they think corporations should be playing to drive LGBTQIA plus equality and the role that they might be playing inhibiting it, whether unconsciously or overtly. Thank you. I think, you know, he's asking an important question, which has come up a lot late, lately, about what can companies do that, that's real? Uh, you know, how, I mean, you're in this world of, you know, brands and people and superstars and big companies. And I love your insights and what more they could be doing, if you have any. I mean, uh, could you imagine if I was like, no? No, <laughs> I, I, yeah. my idea, is, <laughs> I'm like, no. Um, I, I truly feel that... Um, the biggest thing companies can do is to basically create a safe space for their LGBTQ plus um, employees. And, and when there are, when it is pride month, it's not, you know, make your LGBTQ plus employees feel safe and comfortable and at home, not just during the month of June. Um, and I think also when you are creating different higher level positions, really go out of your way to try to make them as diverse as possible. Because I think when the company and the people in those higher up positions truly reflect the world and the community that they're representing, you are collaboratively getting the best ideas from all of the corners that you absolutely can. And I think that's so important in any sort of work environment is that you really want it to be as diverse as possible. Um, because, you know, we're all so much more powerful together. And I think when it's something that's a real initiative and something that you see a company really making um, an effort to do, it, it, they truly are a better and more well, a more well-rounded sort of work environment. And I think they get more done. Oh, Adam, I think the world is much better for what you're doing and inspiring others to do. And, and uh, um, I really appreciate it. This has been a lot of fun, but I've learned a lot from you. And I want to say, um, thank you on behalf of all of our viewers and everyone for uh, sharing your experiences. I'm going to go read your book. Um, and thanks it's so much. Good. And I, hope I just want like to say it. also, best backdrop of the day behind you of any thank of my you. speakers. So yeah, this is really, really good. Very, very, I don't know who or what it is, but it's perfect and happy pride. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you so much. I painted it. So just let me know if you need one. <laughs> okay, I'll be back to you on that. Thank you. Okay, <laughs> thank you so much.
That brings us to the end of our day-long summit, our national summit on LGBTQ rights, uh, whether they're strong, whether they're fragile um, in this important uh, moment in history. The entire program will be posted to the Hill events page so you can go back and watch portions of the program you may have missed, particularly Adam Rippon in the hands. Um, that's, I think it's going to be the big one of the day. Uh, a big thank you to our sponsors, the Rockefeller Foundation and the Philip Morris International, for their support and to all of you attendees. We thank you for watching. And as we end the program, please remember that even though we have come a long way, the LGBTQ plus community is not always able to experience true equality. And I feel that very strongly. Uh, there's a lot more to do. For that to happen, every person, regardless of their sexual orientation, needs to find a way uh, to work with others, to be an ally. Um, I'm Steve Clemens of The Hill, signing off.